Samuel chapter 12. Second to Samuel chapter 12 tonight, and uh, we'll read our we'll read our story or our text tonight, and then after that we will uh, after that we will. Go to Psalms. When you found your text, just look up this way. That way I know that you found it. We'll read it together, beginning at verse 7 tonight. And Nathan said, unto, or said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house, and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. You ever study that verse? That's an interesting one, isn't it? Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and has taken his wife to be thy wife, and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of his son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit because this deed, by this deed thou hast given great occasion to, thine, to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Father, I pray that this evening as we look at sin and repentance and sorrow, that you would help us Help us to know the process. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to know your character well enough. Uh, that repentance would always be the direction that we go. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm not better than David, are you? I want to say I'd never do that. I won't say I'm not capable of that. I just say I want to say I'd never do that. I wouldn't have thought David would either, actually. David's mighty men were so loyal to him. Do you remember when he wanted just a drink from the well of Bethlehem, what his mighty men did? They went and got him some water from the well of Bethlehem, even though that was forbidden territory. And they were in peril of their own lives to get him a drink of water. They loved him so much. I have seen over uh, the years misplaced loyalty. I've seen individuals that demanded line loyalty. He said, don't look carefully at me, just be loyal to me. And oftentimes they, they would say something like, be loyalty to me because of my position. And I don't see David as that kind of a leader myself. Sometimes people demand loyalty, but you know, you can't have loyalty for demanding it anyway, can you? But I've seen individuals that are loyal. Now there's blind loyalty and there's actual loyalty. And uh, you know, Uriah was loyal to David, wasn't he? Uriah, uh, when David said, go home, enjoy yourself, he said, you know what? If the rest of the, if the, rest of, uh, the men are out of battle, I'm not going to go home and, and to live in pleasure while they're fighting a war and they're deprived. And so he slept at the king's doorstep. He was loyal. He was loyal to Israel and he was loyal to King David. And I would never think that David would betray a trust like that, to be quite frank. I think that David's men were loyal to, loyal to him because he was a great leader and he was loyal to God, he was loyal to his country, and he was loyal to them. David fell. And he committed adultery. And he committed murder. Those were the plain facts. Probably, probably, I think, most of Israel was overlooking what David had done. I'm certain that it was known. But do you know sometimes when you like someone, they can do the most atrocious things. They can commit 
the most atrocious acts, and you're willing to think that there must be something or some reason that justifies their actions. You say, Pastor, in the case of murder and adultery? Well, I suspect that uh, only David's general and uh, God knew about the murder. I suspect that they probably allowed that it was incidental that Uriah died and David married his wife. Some may have suspected, but the reality of it is that David appeared to have gotten away with his sin. And my friend, that is our first area of application this evening. And that is that you never get away with sin. No one has ever gotten away with sin. No one has ever sinned unobserved. You say, Pastor, if I sin and I don't involve another person, no one will know. Um, God is everywhere and God is all-knowing. And He knows when you sin. And He'll even tell the right people about you. As He did with Nathan the prophet here. Because Nathan wasn't there. But Nathan knew exactly what David had done because God told him. You know, I'm not a prophet or anything nearly like it. I don't claim to be a prophet, but I've had God tell me things before. I've known things before, and I'm not one of these spooky, ooh, God's put something in my mind and I have a word of knowledge nonsense, but I've known things before. I've just known things. I've just had things just occur to me, like, you know, if I think this is what's going on, I've thought, no. And I've thought, hmm. And I've gone and asked the person, is this what's going on? And they say, how did you know? I said, God told me. That's how I knew. And Nathan was sent by God specifically to confront David and to give him not only uh, not only to give him an indictment, but an ultimatum. And of course, we know the illustration. I think that that Nathan used when he went to David. He used the illustration of a man that had a sheep and he loved his sheep so much that he brought it in the house and slept with it. It was like a you know a house pet kind of a sheep. And some of y'all, you'd do that if you had a sheep, and so don't judge this hypothetical man too terribly much. I've heard people take their dogs and cats into the houses these days, and so I know that, uh, you know, it could happen. You know, you can't, I mean, in our culture, you can't even eat a dog or cat, but you can eat a sheep. So, you know, if you, anyway, people do that sort of thing, so don't look at me with such great disbelief. But a man loved his sheep, brought it in his house, slept with it, and it was his it was like one of the family. It was the only thing he had, the only one he had. And His rich neighbor who had a whole bunch of sheep out in the yard took his sheep, killed it, and ate it. It was the only one he had. Uh, and David was outraged at a man that would take the only sheep a guy has. And then David put his finger, I mean Nathan put his finger right in David's face and said, Thou art the man. He said, That's exactly what you did to Uriah exactly what you did with Bathsheba. The Bible here is not endorsing polygamy. It's so clear in other places. This, this passage is not about polygamy, and this isn't God saying, you know, uh, David, I gave you a whole bunch of wives. God is saying, David, you have a bunch of wives. You know, I recognize that he married uh, Hinoam and Abigail at the same time he'd been married to uh, Michael or Michal, whatever, however you'd like to pronounce her name. I think in the Hebrew it would be Michal. It's not Michelle Smith. Oh, you got to kind of haka. Oh, if you're going to do it like it's actually pronounced, don't tell me it's Michelle. I won't believe it. That's just a nice sounding English name or French name, you know. But uh, McCall is her name. Real sweetheart. Come here, McCall. Sweet. Anyway, uh, that's that's more like the Hebrew. Uh, <laughs> I love English correct pronunciations of Hebrew words that are just so far off. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, but, but David had had many wives. And one of the warnings in the law to the kings of Israel was don't be like the heathen kings who establish relationships and have all these multiple wives. Uh, we know that God said uh, that God defined marriage as a man and a woman. And so whatever this polygamous relationship that David had had was just wicked 
But that isn't what this that isn't what this sin is about. This sin is about murder and adultery. And David has been confronted and given the verdict of what has happened. You did this secretly, but what's going to happen to your wives is going to be done openly. And his own son Absalom was one of the individuals who fulfilled that curse. And what a tragic thing it is that now for David, the sword is not going to depart from his house. And so, <clears throat> that isn't what I want to focus on this evening. What I want to focus on this evening is one of the things that uh, has been on my mind a lot recently as I thought of King David, and that would be what set him apart from other men who were just as wicked as he was. What made him special where God didn't just reject him I mean, if I think about things, forgive me, humanly speaking, it doesn't seem to me so much more terrible for Saul to keep the to keep the best of the oxen and the sheep of the Amalekites. To me, if you're going to choose between keeping sheep and oxen or committing adultery and murder, if I'm going to compare David and Saul, that's I remember being a child and just pondering that. And just thinking, David committed murder and adultery. Saul kept sheep and oxen, and we know he offered a sacrifice that he wasn't, wasn't permitted to. But if I'm going to compare the two, I mean, to me it seems like sin is sin. You know? What was the difference between David and Saul? Well, it wasn't that they were sinners. Well, that made them alike. But what differentiated between these two kings of Israel was their response to conviction. And it's incredible to me that David here doesn't do what a lot of people do. I have before had the unpleasant responsibility of confronting people that have done wrong and had them lie to me about it. Where, you know, I know all the information and it isn't because I've taken sides and believe this person versus this person. I mean, I have all the information and I hate it that they've done wrong, but they've done wrong and I've said, here are the facts, here's the evidence. You've done wrong. And they've tried to just say, it isn't true, it didn't happen, don't believe it, it's not so. I've seen that. Matter of fact, I think that lying and denying is the natural response to being found out. I think it's the fleshly response. The natural fleshly response to being found out is to lie and to deny. Have you seen it? You see somebody get caught and they lie and they deny? I'll tell you what, the whole politicians and the immorality thing, it's just beyond me. Here's, here's my conclusion. Just don't be loyal to men, especially politicians, ever. Don't... <laughs> Listen, don't, don't put your, your hope in a politician. I'm thankful uh, for our current president and some of the things that he's doing. I'm thankful. I, I, listen, we've had my entire lifetime, presidents have promised that they're going to recognize Israel in the correct, appropriate way. And this president actually did. And you know something? That sets him apart from all the others. Did you all see the Supreme Court uh, judgment last week? You no, know, this president was pretty instrumental in that, in, in uh, appointing Gorsuch to the court. And it may be that our country gets a stay in justice in the next appointment when, you know, God help her to be saved first. But when uh, one, of, one of these evil women uh, kicks the bucket in the next couple of years, they're going to on our Supreme Court. And, I, you know, I think about it and I just think, oh, well, I hope they get born again first because they're evil. And uh, I'm thankful that... The king's heart's in the hand of the Lord, as the rivers of water move it whithersoever he will. And I certainly believe that's true with our president right now. He, I mean, he's just doing things that are completely inconsistent with his entire life record. I mean, what he's done his entire life, it's like he's taken a 180 and gone the opposite direction. Uh, someone this last week who knows the president and knows uh, the vice president said that Jeffress, uh, Pastor Jeffress in, in uh, is it Dallas, had led him to the Lord, had led Donald Trump to the Lord, and claimed that Donald Trump had been saved. And that may account for his uh, changed behavior. Something, you know, it's definitely God doing some things there, I, I certainly believe. 
Having said that, I don't, I don't trust any politician at all. Uh, remember a couple of years ago when Herman Cain made his wife say that he hadn't committed adultery in public. I despise a man that will not only do something like that, but will drag his wife to the forefront and make her lie for him. And uh, just bring, I can't imagine doing that to your wife, uh, embarrassing her and then making her say that it didn't happen when she knew full well that the things he'd done had happened. You know, I, <laughs> I'm sorry. Didn't want, I hoped it wasn't true about Herman Cain, but I just had a feeling it was, and it was. And, uh, you know, I don't know why believers follow folks like that. He wasn't repentant. There was no repentance in him. Anyone can do anything, but there's a difference when you do something with how you respond when you're, when you're found out. And David's response was, I have sinned. Ahab and Jezebel, God do so to me and more. Your head is still on your shoulders. <laughs> I mean, this, I'm going to kill you. The prophet confronts him. You don't talk to me like that. I'm a king. You don't confront me about things. And they use their position, their power to threaten the prophet of God. Nathan came in and put his finger in David's face and said, Thou art the man. And David said, I am. You're right. He said, I have sinned. I have sinned. My friend, when you have sinned, God is not done with you. You're still alive. When you have sinned, that's when the devil wants to sift you. That's when he wants you to respond by covering up, by lying or denying and trying to cover up your sin. David had already done the whole cover-up and he'd been exposed. And now Nathan said, you've sinned. And David just simply said, I've sinned against the Lord. He'd say, I've sinned against Uriah. I've sinned against Bathsheba. I've sinned against Israel. He said, I've sinned against the Lord. And Nathan's response is instantaneous. It's incredible. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. He said, David, God, God's forgiven you. You're going to live. But then he said, but you'll have consequences so people know that God has not overlooked this. The baby that you had in your adulterous relationship is going to die. And he did, and David mourned and grieved. I think you know the story of that. Let's go to Psalm chapter 51. That's really where we're going to uh, focus this evening. And I want to look, first of all, at the response to sin. Anyone can sin... But what differentiated David and Saul was Saul said to Samuel, you remember? He said, you know, don't embarrass me in front of the people. Go ahead and offer a sacrifice so everyone will think everything's okay. David said, I've sinned. And everything isn't okay. And then he got his consequences and he responded to his consequences. In verse 1 of Psalm 51, we see the beginning of a prayer that every one of us have prayed if we've ever confessed sin. In other words, if you've ever gotten right with God, you've gone here, you've been here. Matter of fact, I've just turned to Psalm 51. And I've said, you know, that's the model. That's that's what I God, that's my heart. That's that's what I need to pray. That's that's what I need. And this is really the difference between David and Saul is David's ability to humble himself. His ability to not only be small in his own sight, but remain that way. Where Saul got so lifted up with pride, he couldn't repent. He wouldn't repent. My friend, there are so many prideful quotations or ways that our unrepentance can be expressed. Saul's was pretty stereotypical. He's basically saying, I'm the king and it doesn't look good for a king to repent. It's not kingly. And so, you know, don't make me look bad. Some people cloak it this way. They say, you know something, I'm so terrible, I don't deserve to be forgiven, so I won't repent. That's one of the biggest lies ever. You're, you, that's not humility. That's the very opposite of it. So many people would say, I don't deserve to be forgiven, so I'm not going to try. No, you just don't want to be forgiven. You want to continue in your sin. That's the honest truth. 
David, when he was exposed, said, I've sinned. And now he begins in Psalm 51 1 saying, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. Now, the grammar here helps us to understand that it is consistent with the character of God to assert or to give out loving kindness. God is, that's God's character. And he goes on to say, According to. Notice this, the singular mercy, or the sing the the, multi, uh, no, the oh the singular tender mercy. No, it says the multitude of thy tender mercies. You ever repented for the same thing? I mean, here we are again. The temper. Here we are again. The tongue. Here we are again. And David said, According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Do you remember when Jesus was asked the question of how many times should a man be sinned against and forgive? Seven times? And the guy does it to me seven times, should I forgive seven times? What did Jesus say? Seventy times seven. Four hundred ninety times. It wasn't really four hundred ninety times. The idea... There is is obviously that you don't keep track if you've forgiven one time. <clears throat> if you've forgiven one time, then the second time you may remember that you'd already forgiven it, but you don't remember how many times, unless you've got you know a memory that's a lot better than mine. If you've forgiven, it's forgiven. That's over and done with. And so if you got to four hundred, you'd say this is. You know, 489 times, you better look out the next time, bro. No, I don't think so. That isn't really how it is, is it? It's a multitude of thy tender mercies. And then he has this audacious statement, which is, blot out my transgression. In other words, erase it. Scratch it. Make it disappear. On the basis of God's character, listen to me now, your forgiveness by God will never be because of how sorry you are. Your forgiveness by God will never be because of how sincere and how willing you are to change. Your forgiveness by God will be because of how merciful He is. Amen. That's it. Amen. Now some of y'all don't like that about God. But it's because there's a reflection in you. There's a reflection in you of unforgiveness. But it doesn't come from God. David, incredibly enough, had enough experience with this whole mercy and forgiveness thing that when the Holy Spirit moved him to pen this psalm, that he referenced God's multiplied, multitude of tender mercies. And friend, if you don't know this, go ahead and just write it all across the page in your Bible. God always forgives. God always forgives. You're never deserving of forgiveness, but God always forgives. And God always forgives because of His character. And not because of yours. My friend, if you had good character, you wouldn't need forgiveness. So God forgives because of our bad character and because of His good. And David said, God is just characteristic of you. According to the way that you are, that's the why I'm asking, that's the motive behind my asking for your tender mercies. And then he said, God, I don't want to be like this anymore. This is characteristic of repentance. Repentance says, I don't like it. I don't like me. I don't like what I did. And I am not happy being this way, and I want to be different. He says, wash me thoroughly. Wash me. God, wash me clean. God, change me. I don't want to be like this. Wash me 
thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. See, God, I don't want any part of it. I don't want the murder. I don't want the deceit. I don't want the lying. I don't want the cover up. I don't want, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want. I, I want to be thoroughly washed. I don't want to be forgiven for murder and not forgiven for adultery. You know, a lot of people commit adultery and they just want it to be okay. God is sorry I did that, you know, but uh, I'm not sorry about who I committed adultery with, and I'm not sorry about how it's worked out, but I'm sorry I initially did it because that wasn't right. Oh, my friend, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, he said, and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. He said, God, it's just I can't turn right or left without seeing my sin, without having it thrown in my face by the realities. Every time I see Bathsheba, every time I walk outdoors and I see Uriah's house sitting empty over there, Every time I get that look from Ahithophel. Every time I go into the courtyard and I face one of my other wives. Every time Nathan the prophet's in town and I hear about it. He said, my sin is ever before me. Can't escape it. It's just always thrown up against me. And he said this, against thee and thee only. Boy, that's consistent with what he said in, in 2 Samuel, wasn't it? I've sinned against the Lord. He said, against thee and thee only have I sinned. You know, a lot of times we want to think that our sin really, you know, sometimes we'll ignore a person. And I don't believe that's what David is doing here. But he's helping us to understand the magnitude of his sin. This is in God's face. Remember what God said? He said, if this wasn't enough for you, I'd have done more for you. Remember that I gave you this and this and this, and if that wasn't enough, I'd have done whatever. Isn't that incredible? And he said, God, that's who I sinned against. I sinned against a good God. In other words, he's making no excuses. He's not saying, here's why I didn't, you know, I just didn't get any attention. And so this is why I did it. Or I just, the only reason I, or she wanted, or, no. He said, I sinned against a good God and I don't have a good reason. I sinned against the Lord. And he said, Against thee and thee only have I sinned, done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. He said, God, just let's be clear about this. I'm guilty. And he said, here's the source. Verse 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin, did my mother conceive me? He said, God, you know me for a long time, and you know this is pretty par for the course for me. Sometimes we try to throw up our good record. You know, God, it's the first time I've ever done anything like this. David said, I've done this over and over and over again. That's how I know about your the multitudes of your tender mercies. Shaping and sin and in iniquity and sin did my mother conceive me. And he said, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Now he asks for specific cleansing. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. You can do a study on hyssop and the way that that was used uh, for cleaning. He said, Wash me, and I shall be whiter as snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. My friend, remember this. Sin never satisfies and robs you of your joy. Sin, oh, there's pleasure in sin for a season, but that season's short. And the misery's long. And he said, I want the joy back, God. That's audacious, isn't it? I mean, don't you think that maybe even if God were to forgive you, maybe He could just forgive you and not, not kill you, but you know, you're just never going to be happy again? David said, I want that blessed feeling in me again. The joy. The bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. He said, Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Can we pause here for a second and ask ourselves the implied meaning of verse 9? How in the world could God hide his face from David's sin and blot out his iniquity? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That's what washes away sin. Cast me not away from thy. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, 
and renew a right spirit within me. David didn't hear say, you know, God, I wonder if I was ever saved. You know, I play that little game of blaming God. It's, for, if a Christian goes on and on with this, I don't know if I've ever been saved every time they sin, little game. What you're actually doing is you're saying, God, I asked to be saved, but you weren't good enough to save me, so you're responsible for what I do until you do save me. That's what that game plays. But if you actually are honest and real about it, you'll accept the blame for your sin. And that's when God can do something with you about your sin, when you don't blame Him. And He said, renew a right spirit in me. He had a right spirit before. Oh, when David was anointed to be king of Israel, there wasn't a man in Israel that had the spirit that David had. Renew a right spirit in me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. He said, and then I'll tell people about it. This is another area where I think believers who go through the process of repentance and restoration err. How many times a Christian has been forgiven, but they don't want to tell anybody they're forgiven. I understand shame. I understand not wanting to brag on sin. But my friend, a lot of believers just think that they're the only one. No one else has ever been tempted. No one else has ever gone through this. Everyone else is, well, I don't know how you all do it, but you just live the perfect life. David said, I haven't. He said, I'll tell other people about forgiveness. I'll tell them about your ways. I'll teach transgressors your ways. The other thing believers do when they've been forgiven is they feel like they don't have the right to say anything about someone else sinning. They say, well, I, you know what? I've sinned myself. I can't say about them sinning. Well, my friend, if you've been forgiven, you can certainly say something about them sinning. You can say, I did that and it was wrong. And you're doing that and it's wrong, but God forgave me and He can forgive you. Teach transgressors thy ways. A lot of believers are so prideful. They won't even address another believer's sin. And it's either because they're harboring sin themselves or they're focusing not on the forgiveness that they've received, they're focusing either on the shame they just don't want people to know that they've ever done wrong. I don't see that as repentance, my friend. When you've been forgiven, you ought to tell people. Let the redeemed of the Lord Thank say you. so. Hey, God forgave me. I sinned. Yes, I did. But God's forgiven me. God can forgive you. And boy, that's an encouragement. Man, to have somebody who you look to and you say, you know, that's a person that demonstrates the fruit of the Spirit in their life. And they say, you know what? I haven't always done right, but God's always forgiven me. And I've been restored. You know, I'm the same as you are. We're both made out of sinful flesh. You know, you were shaped in iniquity and, and your mother conceived you in sin, same as mine did. Both sinners. And then he said, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. How did David have the courage to not just let Ahithophel kill him? See, if I'm David and someone says, you know, Ahithophel is plotting against you. Remember David said, he said, God, confound the counsel of Ahithophel. He knew if Ahithophel spoke, it was like God spoke. It was like God said it. He was just such a wise man. His counsel was so good. David wronged Ahithophel. How do you have the audacity to ask God to take his side in it? He understood forgiveness. Friend, God's not against a forgiven believer. You're not, you are not a less loved or less valued or less in fellowship Christian if you're forgiven. God's forgiveness is full. And He said, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, Thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of Thy righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth Thy praise. Thy praise. Then he said the same thing that he said when he bought the threshing floor of Arana for sacrifice. He said, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Well, I may have done wrong, but I don't need to be treated like I'm, you know, like I'm wearing a scarlet letter. I don't need to be put to a shame. I don't need to have everybody looking at me. I don't, I don't need to come in front of the church and and, uh, and, you know, I don't need to acknowledge it with anybody. Only God can judge me. That, no, no, my friend. 
You won't care what anyone thinks about you if you care what God thinks about you. You say, well, I'm not going to go back to church anymore. I don't know how many Christians that believe that lie. They claim to be forgiven. I'm not going to go back to church anymore because, you know, because of what everybody thinks about me. That's not consistent with repentance or forgiveness or contrite spirit. How about, I can understand why people think that about me, but it's a good thing God doesn't. And that's the right attitude. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. He said, God doesn't want an offering. God doesn't want to be bought off. He said, but if I give God a broken heart, a contrite spirit, and then I give an offering, he'll be pleased by it. And here we see David's conclusion with restoration. God, after you've forgiven me, then I can offer sacrifice. Then I can do things that please you. And again, we've come full circle because now we are looking once more at the character of a God who is, it's according to His loving kindness and it's according to the multitude of His tender mercies that He blots out transgressions. And friend, I will say this to you again in conclusion this evening, that it's in the character of God to forgive sin. I love how Solomon uh, uses the illustration in Ecclesiastes. I believe it's chapter 9. A, dead, a live dog is better than a dead lion. That's a pretty good illustration. You may be a dog, but if you're breathing, it's better than being dead than being a lion. And the idea there is that if you're breathing, God can use you. If you're breathing, God isn't finished. But people say, God's done with me. God's finished with me. No. If that were so, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be breathing any longer. You'd be in a grave. And you'll be in a grave when God's finished with you, but you're not. And so God's tender mercies and His loving kindness, my friend, are evidence that you can be forgiven, restored, and have the joy of your salvation and testify to others and that you can offer sacrifice. And God will be pleased with your life. Literally, you can move heaven to pleasure in spite of what you've done because of what He's done. Now, isn't God good? Father, thank You so much for this truth. Lord, all of us need to know the way to respond when we're confronted with sin the appropriate steps of repentance, and then, God, how to get back to serving Jesus. And I pray that you would help us to be able to practice it consistently throughout our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I have something. It's, it's a little something. Little something.